She has no fixed title, but has spent the last few years working in the field of fermentation and pickling and all sorts of different kind of things. So I'm not sure how people feel about pickle, pickles or things like that, what comes to mind when you think of it. But hopefully Kathy here will broaden your mind as to what's possible and what she's been doing recently. And also we'll be doing some pretty hands-on stuff this afternoon. So if everyone could give a warm welcome to Kathy. Cats are magic. <laughs> My last name is Kach Magic. Cool. So it's like, it's actually kind of funny because no one can pronounce. Is this on? Uh, <laughs> um, it's like saying Catch Magic with like a bit of an accent. Kach Magic, Catch Magic. Um, and I'm, everyone's like, oh my God, you ferment. It's like you're catching magic. And I was like, it's a bit too cheesy. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I'm going to talk to you about a whole world of fermentation and a lot of my experiments. So, um, everything in this world ferments. So there is yeast and bacteria everywhere. And we have to remember that um, we would be nowhere without bacteria. So one of the reasons why we all look so different is because there's different bacteria all over the world and bacteria had kind of like helped make up our genes. So we all look so different. Um, and another really important thing to sort of remember is that there's a lot of bacteria sort of within us. And so this is your gut. So we're quickly just gonna talk about your gut and your microbiome just to kind of get a scope about your inside. Um, so a quick little question. Does anyone know where your stomach is actually located? Can anyone say? <laughs> no? All right. So uh, <laughs> everyone thinks their stomach is like right here. It's actually right here. So it's like right below your breast and like right above your rib. And so there's three parts to your microbiome. And one part has all the bacteria inside of it. And yes, that is a photo of your large intestine. <laughs> um, so you have your stomach, your small intestine, and your large intestine. Stomach, your food goes in. It all gets broken apart. And then your small intestine. Um, that starts to sort of pull out different vitamins and minerals within our food, not dealing with any sort of bacteria. And you see all those dots right there in your large intestine, that's where bacteria exists within you. So you should have about 100 trillion bacteria that are existing within your large intestine. Um, and this comes with a proper diet and all these other things, but also, so this is the inside of us and we have to remember that there's a whole world so you have just the culture and the art of fermentation every single civilization has fermented because we used to live in farming cultures and because there is bacteria everywhere and things would break down people also realized that this was a way to preserve their food so this is kind of where i came in with what i do so I, um, I'm Polish-American, and I grew up in, um, with two Polish immigrant parents in New York City in a strictly Polish household. So Polish food was a lot of sauerkraut, sourdough bread, yogurt, kefir, you name it. And a few years ago, I got super just into going back to my food culture, and so I went back to sauerkraut. And when everyone, someone, whenever someone hears about sauerkraut, they're just like, Ooh, sauerkraut, like, I don't know, like, I don't really like that. Um, so I thought, like, cool, I'll learn about this one process that I grew up with and kind of how can I explore from there. And so something, like, on the left was my explorations into sauerkraut. So using different, flav different vegetables and, um, but working with one process and kind of I studied the culture and the history that I had grown up with and then it's like well How could I manipulate it? And I started to get loads of different sort of lactic acid flavors rather than the one that everyone was always used to So this was just by changing up vegetables working with different times just getting used to this one process And then I thought about well, what's like another type of vegetable ferment and so you have kimchi and everyone thinks that kimchi is this one square cut cabbage that's really spicy. But to know that kimchi started as white kimchi in the, um, the 12th century, and so, or in the 7th century, and then it becomes spicy until the 12th century. And that there's over 200 recipes, and it's a different process for fermenting your vegetables that gives totally different flavors. But it's about going back, exploring sure, like the art and the history of it, and kind of how can you take these traditional processes and work with it to make new flavors. 
And so this was an, so I kind of kept going, I like, I'm going to keep exploring anaerobic fermentation. And so anaerobic fermentation is fermentation that doesn't include oxygen within it. Um, so you have sauerkraut would be one of them, kimchi, it's just things that are buried that are then sort of like pressed down. And the next thing I went into was um, butter. So I love butter and you have culture, like who doesn't love butter? Um, so I went into exploring cultured butter and there's just loads and then you just you know see the scope of how different civilizations had been making cultured butter to preserve a cooking fat. And um, one of my loved butters, so it's called Pete's Bog Butter. And if anyone had read an article of maybe like a year ago that came out two years ago about a butter that was over a thousand years old, Pete's Bog Butter. Um, so this was my experiment into, I aged this butter for one year and four months and to see like what the, bac like what the bacteria would do to the sugars and the proteins within the butter. Um, and then from there, I was like, well, I'm working with all these sort of different lactic acid flavors. What would happen if I took the moisture out of it? And I started dehydrating all my krauts and all my kimchis to see, like, I'm getting all these really interesting different flavors. When you take out the moisture, like, how does, it, like, what's, what do you get after that? Like, what's, like, the pungency? So just trying to, yeah, just keep exploring different flavors through different methods. Um, and so... Of course, like when you start making all these things and making different sauerkrauts, you start getting molds. And so I was like, oh, well, kind of broadening my, um, my mind to like, what are other sort of ferments? So you have aerobic fermentation. Aerobic fermentation is when you use oxygen. And so I wanted to explore good and bad molds. Um, so bad mold. Um, it's mold that grows on top of your sauerkraut. It's bad in the sense that you don't want to eat that, but it's fine where you could scoop that off, but you sort of realize it, get, it could give this like a bit of like um, not, not the most pleasant sort of palatable flavor that would exist on top of your sauerkraut for a ferment that is anaerobic. Um, but then you have a beautiful mold, and so that's koji. So it kind of moved me into exploring more of Asian ferments. And koji, so the specific mold is called Aspergillus arise, and it's traditionally grown on rice or barley, and this is how you get sake and how you get miso, you get soy sauces. So it's an, a mold that had only existed within Japan and China. Um, and when you grow it, it's really sweet and it's really beautiful. And then when you make a sake out of it, or another drink is amazake, or what can you grow like ko like koji on and the different flavors you can get? Like loads of people are experimenting now with growing it on different vegetables or growing it on meat. So you could take what would be cured meat that would, well, like the cured meat flavor of like you take meat and you cure it for a few months to a year. But by growing koji on it, which would take two days, you get things that are super similar, like just working with bacteria and like trying to explore different flavors you can get. Um, which then led me to more Japanese fermentation. So on, um, on the left is um, nukazuke. So it's another ferment where um, traditionally it's a rice bran bed that you'd have vegetables put inside and sort of ferment. And it adds like a really nutty, really slight lactic acid flavor, completely different that you would get from say a sauerkraut or a kimchi, which are other lactic acid ferments. Um, by just the yeast and bacteria that are within the bran. So I started doing experiments instead of rice bran, local bran, so wheat bran, oat bran, or on the right is, um, that's a garlic that I had fermented in miso for one year and it's called miso zuke. Uh, so it's a miso that I had made that wasn't very traditional and then um, just an, kind of exploring another ferment of bearing something and like seeing the different flavors that you get. And um, and as I kept exploring, I kept learning about just, wow, like there is different bacteria that exist within the world that are creating these different flavors and kind of delving in on that scope a bit more. So um, last year I had done a residency with Sander Katz. So does anyone know the book, The Art of Fermentation at all? So um, Sander does these fermentation residencies and I went there last year in Tennessee. And so he pulled out these leaves. So if you've ever heard of tempeh, before, like anyone, tempeh. Um, so this, this is the mold that tempeh comes from, and so these are two hibiscus leaves, and it'll only grow in Indonesia. 
Um, so what had happened is like these leaves would kind of stick together and based on the humid environment and the temperature and everything around in Indonesia, uh, you'd have the specific tempeh mold that would grow and you can't grow it anywhere else. So just kind of thinking like, oh, well, this one location will get me this flavor, will get me this mold, and that's sort of it. Um, and then I, so just kind of kept going from there, because recently I went to Mexico, and I spent a month there trying to explore Mexican fermentation. And so everyone here, or maybe most people here, have eaten a tortilla before, right? <laughs> so, um, so there is a process called corn nixtamalization, and it's not technically a fermentation process itself, but one of the ways I would define fermentation or fermentation is defined is a breakdown of certain toxins or anti-nutrients. Like the bacteria is powerful enough to do that and it's how civilizations have sort of worked with their food either to get different flavors or make things edible around them that they couldn't possibly eat. And so corn is one of them. If you kind of would just to eat corn without nixtamalizing it, um, it, this disease called pellagra, you just you would get it because you're not actually getting any vitamins or minerals or nutrients. So the Mayans, the Aztecs, and the Mexicans had developed that by putting the corn in an alkali solution, so it's either limestone or wood ash, it would break down the corn enough that you could get some niacin from it, which is vitamin B. Um, so I went to a restaurant called Criollo, and this is in Oaxaca, and I was, I mean, I was shown nixtamalization kind of throughout different bits of Mexico, but this was just the nicest sort of part of it. Um, and so here you see the corn is being soaked with cal, so it's limestone, and what happens is it gets cooked, it gets cooked for about an hour to two hours, depending on how, if the corn is young or the corn is... Um, older, and then it's left to sit for the day, and this is where the limestone will break apart the corn a little bit, and then it would get milled and made into fresh tortillas that then um, you could eat and are a, lot, are a lot easier, but this is where now a lot of people are starting to explore nixtamalizing different things, like they're starting to nixtamalize potatoes and nixtamalize different kinds of grains, and it's like, well, what are the textures and flavors that are sort of open and out there? Um, and that's how you could buy cal in a market in Oaxaca. <laughs> um, and so, and the final thing that I spent um, working on this summer was uh, discovering or working with different bacteria that's in yogurts. And on the left you have uh, kefir grain scobies. So when I was at Sanders residency as well, I got an heirloom yogurt culture. And so the bacteria within that culture is um, a century old. And I was, this was something that I had been looking for, just kind of also in the state of like dying heirloom cultures. I was really jazzed, like, cool, I have this like one culture and like just tasting the different flavors from that. And, um, and I was like, but I will know that there's more out there. So what other places could I get sort of a culture from? So this summer, I got two more yogurt cultures. I got a Turkish yogurt culture where the bacteria is straining from Turkey, and I got a Vili. So has anyone ever heard of Vili or is aware of any like yogurts within Scandinavia? <laughs> so um, the yogurts that we're used to are called thermophilic yogurts. So it's yogurt, it's milk that you heat up, cool down, add the culture. And so that would be this Romanian yogurt culture and this Turkish yogurt culture I had gone. Vili is different, Scandinavian yogurts are different, where it's a mesophilic uh, yogurt culture, so mesophilic bacteria, there's no heating involved. And then you could think about how Scandinavia is quite cold, so the way the bacteria interacts with the milk is completely different. So Scandinavia is known for ropey yogurts, and that's exactly what this yogurt is. So you just take milk, you add some of the Vili culture, you let it ferment, and it, what the bacteria does is it creates exopolysaccharide chains. So these are chains that just the sugars bond together. So you basically have like a goopy mass. And that sounds really gross, but it's really amazing to see like it's the same milk, but by just working with different bacteria from different parts of the world, it reacts with the sugars and the proteins in completely different ways. And this is the mildest yogurt you'll ever eat. Like it just tastes like a really slight sort of mushroom lactic flavor, totally different from thermophilic yogurts. Or the Turkish yogurt and the Romanian yogurt also completely different. The Romanian one is far more acidic and the Turkish one kind of has a sweet side to it. And another really cool thing about the Vili is it's one of the only yogurts that'll have Geotrichum candidum grow on top of it. So if you've ever seen that little white like mold that grows on goat's cheeses, or is that surrounded by goat's cheeses? Geotrichum candidum. <laughs> 
um, or this or some milk kefir scobies. So um, everyone has probably heard about kombucha and a kombucha scoby, but scoby is an acronym for symbiotic community of bacteria and yeast. And this is, was a completely spontaneous thing that happened within life. And so that also is streaming around like Russia and Asia, but that's where kombucha comes from. And then milk kefir scoby is the same thing. So it's just, well, it had it appeared in milk and it happened abruptly and there's actually no possible way, like no scientist, no lab has been able to recreate a scoby. It's just nature's sort of own thing. Um, and so milk kefir grains, what they do is it's a combination of yeast and bacteria and so that's why it's called the champagne of milks or also why kombucha will be so carbonated. It's because you have the yeast eating sugars and you have lactic flavors from the, the bacteria within it. So it's just a completely different method of fermenting sort of the same thing and a totally different flavor. Um, so this is just what I want to kind of give to you guys is just some food for thought and some scope that there is a whole world of bacteria out there. You get loads of different flavors and it's kind of about going to different or just exploring different cultures, different histories and these processes because it brought us to where we are today and kind of seeing then like, oh, like what if I change this thing or change this thing like where you could kind of keep growing the flavor there um, because all of it can be applied to coffee because everything in the world are from it. So, thank you. Here, take this. <laughs> I don't know where we're gonna be. Oh, we, it's working. <laughs> it's working? Until. <laughs> I like how I got the old school one, and I'm like, well, what I do is kind of. Yeah, more old school. <laughs> cool, take a seat. So it was super interesting. I, th I think it's these parts are really cool because sometimes we can get, like Ben said, a little insular, a little bit too coffee focused. Um, so one, again, kind of, I thought it might be interesting to hear because I don't think you went, you didn't, I know you didn't go to school to learn how to ferment things. I mean, I'm sure there is a school somewhere. I mean, in Tennessee, clearly. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, what's driven you down this path that's kind of like, you know, you're doing your own thing. How has that been like trying to basically forge your own career in something that's completely off the beaten track? Um, so I, I've always kind of loved food and grew up with it, but I went to art school. I was a painting major and my dad is a woodworker and so just do a lot of hands-on things. Um, is this on? <laughs> Hello. Um, and uh, I, so I was, bef I moved to London at the end of May, but before I was living in Berlin for two years. And I, I, I guess when I started to go back into this like Polish food culture exploration, I just started carrying like sourdough bread and sauerkraut with me everywhere. And I would always give it to people and I'd be like, oh, do you want some of this? Or do you want some of this? Because I'd have so much of it. Or you get really into just making it. Or if, if anyone has ever baked sourdough bread, like you're always going to have a lot of bread left over and you just need to start finding like people to give it to. And so my name is Kathy and I'm quite chatty. Uh, so, um, about a little over a year ago, I had friends who were just like, um, so you keep sharing all these things with people and then you keep reading about all this stuff that people really want to know about, like, why don't you just start getting groups of people together and, like, talking to them and, like, also getting paid for it? Um, <laughs> so that's how the workshops had started and I think as I was getting into the workshops and seeing like people's interest in it and then you also start reading about you know the fad of fermentation had also started where everyone would come and they'd be like oh I heard about this or like I heard about that or this or that and that there's a lot of misinformation or a lot of fear like thinking about how you know civilizations grew up with this like they people were fermenting and preserving their food and it was such a normal thing and we're so afraid of it today like we're afraid when like something starts bubbling or a flavor that we've never tasted before or if you get mold on your sauerkraut like I had shown before and you if you google it it's like throw it out there's mold it's bad you know we're and then kind of the more I started to get into it, the more it kind of kept growing and the more I was like, well, I want to keep learning and I want to keep talking to people about it because if you don't, there's sort of not much out there and a lot of people then get really misinformed. So I felt like if I'm already really into it, 
I should just like keep going. Just keep going. Yeah. And I think that probably speaks to a lot of people in the room who are pursuing coffee, which is not always seem to be like the most obvious career path. Um, one thing that struck me that I think it's a, and I'm not expecting any firm answer, but it's just a really interesting topic. I think recently for anyone who follows the barista competitions or, or a lot of what's going on with the green coffee world, there's a lot of interest in fermentation around the processing side of green coffee. And I think it's, it's super interesting that um, basically so far all fermentation in coffee processing has been wild fermentation. And there's now like people trying to inoculate or add particular yeasts or particular bacteria to coffee as it's being processed to see what results they can get. And listening to your talk, I almost feel like part of that reflects what you're doing where you're taking, um, you know, uh, fermentation from a particular culture and bringing it to some different food or different grains or whatever but then also I know that I, I from from speaking to you in the past that you kind of feel positive about wild fermentation and stuff like that and so do, do you think it's a good idea that people should be messing with stuff already like experimenting the way you're doing or you think the old ways are sometimes the best ways um, I think like what they're doing now is just like a touch on the old ways I kind of like yeah exactly what you said what I'm doing um no I think it's good I think if you're working with like you had said like people use like specific yeast strains and stuff and they're sort of working with that I think that's sort of a good scope because you know sometimes I guess with coffee because you're also going to need to make a lot of it or you know like have more of a consistency so it kind of builds a comfort where like I know with this yeast strain this is happening and I'm getting this flavor and like you can sort of work there um, to build like a sort of consistency. I think if you're going to do wild fermentation to know that's always going to be different you're never going to get the same exact thing because you could use the same beans but if they're grown different times or you know could different like the same time each year is always going to be different because you have a new set of bacteria, a new set of yeast. Um, so I think both, I think just the having, working with concentrated strains that you could get from different places just add consistency. But it could still add like a various flavors and sort of you could work from there. I think if you're going to work fully on the scope of wild fermentation, there's going to be, a, it's going to be loads of trial and error and you could get really amazing, exciting things. And you could also get things that highly fail, but it'll be a lot harder to control and like manipulate those environments. But that, to me, that's the exciting part. For a massive business, it's a bit different. Yeah. That's an interesting perspective. I hadn't really thought about it on the consistency side. Um, before we throw it out to the audience, mm. I just want to ask, like, what's your desert island pickle? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's like keep being asked this and I don't know, it's so hard. Um, no, I'm just going to say sauerkraut. You know, just go like, I'd be nothing without it. Also, that first photo, it's on sourdough bread with crunchy peanut butter and sauerkraut bread, or sauerkraut, so best snack in the world. I, I see at least one or two faces like, and <laughs> I, I kind of feel similar, but. No, uh, it's great, it's great. I promise. Um, does anyone have any questions? Hopefully, someone. <laughs> there you go. Thanks for that talk. I'm, I'm quite curious about your laboratory and are all these different fermentations going on at the same time, or do you have quite an interesting aroma, like aromatic house, or <laughs> where do you <laughs> conduct your experiments? Um, well, right now, it's um, under the stairwell in my house that my roommates have built out for me. <laughs> But um, I, wanna, I got back from Mexico in the beginning of November, and so I've been looking for a space, and I actually um, might have a cave space in London to kind of be progressing on all the ferments. So soon I will have a space to be working and like pushing things a bit further, especially with, um, with growing the mold. So in the mold, you growing molds, you do need to sort of make a very specific environment. With the other ferments, that just don't work with oxygen. It's a lot easier to kind of experiment, jar it away, move it over, no smells, nothing. Um, like growing kojis, like you incubate it for two days and you're growing it at a specific temperature and you need to sort of be eyeing it and smelling it and doing things like that. So 
Um, soon, yeah, right now that's also my house, but because it smells nice, my friend, my roommates are quite fine with it. <laughs> they actually, like, get really excited, too. Like, in the beginning, it was a bit, like, of a, ooh, like, what is all this stuff? And now it's, like, when they try it and they taste it, they're like, oh, yeah, cool, what are you making today? <laughs> cool. I'm over here now. I do this thing. I'm a really bad host. I'm always, like, flo floating around. Um, does any more, any questions? Questions? Yeah. Um, so, what well kind of that first part where it's like, you know, we sort of grew up with them, um, like, oh, so that the whole gut, it's called your enteric nervous system, and also as this world was forming, and like, you know, we were basically forming from bacteria. Um, well our gut was the first thing to form, and then you have that concentration of bacteria inside. And then there's just more and more research that's coming out, like all most of your immune cells are concentrated within your gut. So if you think about all the autoimmune diseases that are happening today, it's a huge part of every culture used to eat fermented food because it was, you know, people would be preserve, preserve their food, times of scarcity, um, you know, they, they would eat it and they would, it would make them feel good. It was a whole, you know, history of trial and error for like how these food cultures had come. Um, but little did they know like all the actual health benefits and things that were, you know, coming from it. And as we became industrialized and as we started to move away from these food cultures and especially away from fermentation, like we have refrigeration, you know, you, can, you don't need to be preserving your food. Um, you know, you start seeing signs of all these autoimmune diseases. We started eating more processed foods. We, s we just started having not proper diets that our bodies were used to for hundreds of thousands of years. And so you're seeing the backlash of it now. And now the research that's going back into it is showing that um, bacteria is really important, you know, or even that we're living this like 99.9% .9 like clean sort of antibacterial life, like that's horrible for you. And so there's more and more research going into bacteria around us, bacteria within us. A lot that had been done on sort of um, autoimmune diseases and these immune cells that are concentrated within your gut, just showing that we do need it. It's not like, you know, don't eat this because that's bad for you or don't eat this because that's good for you. It's like, no, it's like you need to eat this. Like you're, we live in this relationship with this bacteria and like you need to feed it and like stay healthy. One thing that I think comes off the back of that is kind of, um, let's say you don't want to start fermenting lots of stuff and take over the bottom underneath yeah. your stairs and your or wherever it might be. Um, do you think shop bought pickles and shop bought fermented products are, you know, would have the same positive effect as as something you might make yourself? Um, that's actually a, like a really big thing because. When I said it in sauerkraut in the beginning, where like you say sauerkraut and everyone's like, oh, that's not something I want to eat because they haven't had good sauerkraut. Like that's been made with a pasteurized vinegar. And sure, vinegar is a ferment. When it's pasteurized, you kill all the bacteria. And then you take cabbage and you put that with vinegar. And it's like, you're just eating cabbage that tastes like vinegar. It's like, that doesn't taste very good. Um, and so the same thing with different pickles that you'd buy. It's like, it's just pasteurized vinegar. So it's all like nothing is that exciting also none of that is good for you like it's just pickled it's not actually this like fermented process um so that's where like you know and you can't buy a lot of these things or when you can buy them it's kind of just like 10 pounds for a jar of sauerkraut and all this stuff um so i mean if you can get it from around you it's great um but that's where i feel like the workshops are the most important that Cabbage isn't that expensive, salt isn't that expensive, just learning how to do it. And like, you'll always find at least like a jar or something to kind of put it aside. Um, but yeah, I guess like. So no, Yeah, you I mean, have I to do it yourself. Yeah, you, I, I say you would, unless like you can dish out loads of money on, you know, like kefir, like all this stuff is really easy. It's just that we, you know, we've grown so busy and we've grown so far apart from it. So you think you don't have the time, but a lot of it is just kind of like, taking five minutes or taking a minute to like mix something really quickly and leave it alone. And so it's just kind of developing a comfort with these really old processes and then knowing that it's like, it's actually really simple. Like you don't need to spend another like five pounds on like a little tiny bottle of kefir. Cause it is a, you know, since it's a fad, it's a growing market where someone's like, it's not really around. I could just like bump up the price on this. And it's so kind of sad to see.
I know you you worked for a brief well, for a while with uh, cheese producers. Might might that be the one exception for this? Like because oh, of yeah. yeah, so because most good cheeses at least are going to be made with real mold. That doesn't sound very appealing, <laughs> does it? <laughs> but is that true or? Yeah, um, well, yeah, that's, um, so I worked for a raw cheese stand in Berlin called Alte Milch, and so a lot of people would come up to the stand and be like, these prices are kind of outrageous, like, they're really, they're really high for, like, me wanting to buy good cheese, and I think that's a, a bit of a different side in that conversation where we would be working directly with producers, and because there's such a massive cheese industry that can make really cheap cheeses on cheap milk and you know just all that stuff but then people who are trying to make it properly and still kind of have the whole art in it are struggling where they need to raise their prices and it's like this should be n maybe like close to the normal price of cheese but we've become so used to these really cheap prices of cheese that people are just going to buy those rather than support the people who are still trying to make a practice out of it and like usually have their own sort of like dairy farm and stuff. So um, I think that's a bit different where it's like, it, that's a different scope where it's like, if you can just support it a little bit or like get it, like it's nicer to do that. And that's why you have to think in this whole like realm of food or like really what you buy, you know, it's like do, you know, I'm sure, you know, same with coffee, it's like, am I gonna spend more money like not as often on this one thing just to try and support it rather than like if you buy like the cheaper product well it's like then you're just supporting this bigger industry that's killing that one thing that you wish to support and like you probably you know morally would want to do so i think we can all agree with yeah. that <laughs> to a certain extent we all need coffee every day well, i hope we all do oh ben has a question I'm only vaguely aware of some attempts to do secondary fermentation with coffee that would change the flavor profile of that coffee. So I think there are people out there claiming allegedly to be able to reduce bitterness, uh, increase sweetness and acidity in coffee with another round of fermentation that potentially gets mediocre coffees up into the speciality range. I've never had any. I don't know if this is true. Mm -hmm. But if you were going to try to do something like that with a green product, are there rules of thumb? like? If you were going to try to increase sweetness and reduce bitterness in a product like that, are, are there certain bacteria that you would go for? Are there certain rules of thumb that you would try in order to try to manipulate flavor in that way? Um, I guess if I would think about green coffee specifically, kind of that, I would think maybe like the process of koji or like kind of growing something on top of it because you know with coffee fermentations like the cherries are sort of soaking and like that's like what's surrounding it is being fermented and instantly I would just think of well a koji mold could maybe like kind of break things down from the outside and add like a flavor there and then you know, the roasting process so that's the only first thing that I could think about that would be like yeah that was the one that was on the rice so because if you, like sauerkraut and kimchi and all that stuff is just too far different or like putting something in a like I don't think coffee beans in a brine would work quite well sort of thing so um, that would be my first sort of initial yeah it's interesting to think about coffee as that more like because you at one point defined fermentation as like fermentation that goes on inside something versus mm -hmm. outside and I guess yeah thinking about the cherry and the remaining root mucilage or whatever it is, that is actually on the outside, which is something I, I don't think I'd really considered before. So, yeah. mm. but like, there, yeah. You know, thinking about how, um, you know, what bacteria actually does and the power of, of it, because it essentially is just breaking down the food in front of us, which we do get these amazing flavors, but then just makes it like really easy for our bodies to digest. So, like if you're, you know, like, you just need to think about like the sort of wider scope that way and then everything else is just like different sort of flavor profiles you can get. So if I was going to go for something sweet that would be like surrounding like a green coffee, I just, through my different experiments and sort of things, I would just veer towards like a, a koji and like what I've just seen that it's done sort of thing. Cool. I think we should give Kathy a round of applause.